I'm Jock Climby, and I'm ready to start digging deep. I'm Mark Sutcliffe. Welcome to Digging Deep, presented by Zen Books and Abacus Data. This is the latest in our series of one-on-one conversations with thoughtful, accomplished people in many different fields. We talk to astronauts, athletes, entrepreneurs, musicians, television hosts, and more. We explore their stories, their challenges, their defining moments, and we all get to learn from them the powerful lessons that we can apply to our own lives. We start off with some rapid-fire questions to get to know the guest a little bit, and then we start digging deep into those stories and life lessons. Our guest today is retired professional football star, television analyst, and lawyer Jock Climey. Although he started to play football at a relatively late age, Jock became a star in high school and university, and he went on to play 12 seasons in the Canadian Football League. And here's the incredible part. While he was still playing football, Jock continued his studies, he became a lawyer, and he began practicing employment law in the off-season. And he also served as a television analyst on CFL broadcasts for 17 seasons after his playing career ended, all the while continuing to work full-time as a lawyer. I think you will be amazed and inspired by Jock's story, which he shares very, very candidly. I wanted to hear from him about how he managed to juggle professional sports, studying law, practicing law, and working in television, and he shared a lot about that. He also talked about his experiences with racism after being adopted by white parents and growing up as the only black child in his environment. He also shares the devastating story of losing his sister. Jock talks about achieving your greatest potential and why that's different for everyone. He talks about confronting and overcoming doubts. He talks about starting with long odds, but doing all the small things you have to do to increase those odds. Now, one last thing before we get started. If you like what you hear, please subscribe to our podcast. Please post a review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen and share this podcast with your network. And if you're looking for more information about this episode of the show, including links to anything we reference in our discussion, if you want to read my daily blog, where I post every single day of the year, or subscribe to The Weekly Dig, my weekly newsletter, which has five very quick items I've learned about each week, please go to our website, letsdigdeep.com. That's letsdigdeep.com. You can also find a link to my TEDx talk. Now, let's start digging deep with Jock Climbing. Jock, it's a great pleasure to welcome you to Digging Deep. Uh, I really appreciate you joining us. You've had such an interesting and varied career and a very interesting life as well. Uh, we have lots of mutual friends, but we've never actually spent a lot of time together. So I'm I'm really excited to have this opportunity to to chat with you. Thanks very much for joining us today. Oh, it's my pleasure. So let's start with some quick questions. Uh, and starting with your childhood, what would you say is your fondest childhood memory? Uh, well, my dad was a doctor in the military. So uh, we spent, uh, well, every two to three years we moved, uh, including eight years in Europe, uh, some in Kingston and Ottawa. So certainly uh, seeing the world uh, with my brothers and sister, uh traveling through uh europe in a volkswagen van uh some great memories there who was your hero when you were 10 years old i'm not sure many uh many people other than the most diehard cfl football fans would uh, know this name but larry highbaugh was a defensive back with the edmonton eskimos uh, when they won those five championships back in the uh, 70s and 80s and uh, for whatever reason that guy captured my imagination like nobody else ever did and and uh he was absolutely my hero at that age wow i remember him i remember those eskimos it was late 70s right uh, that they won five in a row yeah. yeah what did you what did you think you were going to be when you grew up did you did you aspire to be a, a football player at that age yeah if you ask me and people did you know when i was five years old what do you do when you grow up i said i'm going to play for queen football i'm going to play in the cfl and they'd laugh and and just think that was being a kid Um, somehow it came true. Wow. What is your life story in six words? Uh, Six words. Uh, Dream, doubt, commit, succeed. Okay. 
I like that. I, I'm going to ask more about that coming up. What is your greatest mistake and what did you learn from it? Uh, pr probably, um, uh, probably taking uh, economics uh, as an undergrad degree when I got to Queens because uh, it sounded like a respectable sort of a major. I knew nothing about it. I didn't care about it. I didn't like it. In fact, I hated it. But it sounded respectable and learning to do things not because you think it sounds like the right thing to do, but because you're actually passionate about something uh, uh, wound up being something that I took away from that experience. For what do you feel most grateful? Uh, uh, I, I feel most grateful for my for my parents. Um, I was adopted um, at uh, two months of age, uh, and uh, my parents. Uh, this is late '60s, uh, and there were uh, uh, a fair number of. Uh, well, by then there were there were lots of uh, uh, people who wanted to adopt, but there weren't a lot of people who wanted to adopt visible minorities or uh, infants who had some sort of a disability, and so uh, as a black baby um they uh, decided that they would um they would my mother was working for cas at the time they decided that they would uh, uh take me and then six months later they took my sister who had a good chance of having the huntington gene um and so after having their own child they adopted uh, aaron and i and then they had another uh, another child my 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 brother so i'm eternally grateful that they uh uh, at that point in their lives, they're in their mid twenties, uh, decided to give, uh, to give me a, an opportunity that otherwise never would have had. Wow. That's really heartwarming. That's really inspiring. What has been the best year of your life so far and why? Yeah, I, I'd have to go back to 1990. Uh, I was drafted fourth overall in the CFL in the first round, uh, by the Toronto Argos. And, and so that was sort of the culmination of a lifelong dream to uh, to to make it to the CFL. But what made it especially um, special was that I uh, was also in when I got drafted in my first year of law school. So I knew at that moment that I'd figured out a way to give myself a chance to do the two things that I thought most important in life. One is to pursue my my chosen profession at that point, which was law, that I really believed was going to be what I was going to do for the rest of my life, and combine that with a passion to play uh, uh, professional football. And uh, that all came together in 1990. What has been the toughest year of your life so far and why? Uh, the toughest year was, was five years ago uh, when I went through uh, a separation, uh, ultimately a divorce. Uh, uh, having to split uh, up a family with three wonderful children um, after uh, being with the same woman for 18 years um, was was incredibly difficult. Um, and uh, in the same year, uh, within three months of that, my uh, sister uh, passed away, the sister who I mentioned earlier who had the Huntington's gene. She had a 50-50 chance of having the gene. Um, and it wasn't until she was well into her forties that she got tested, found out she had it and then ultimately passed away. So, uh, yeah, that year, that year was a bad year. Yeah. I'm very sorry to hear that. What one person would you say has had the greatest impact on your life? Uh, I'd have to say my father. Uh, so he, he played at Queens football, uh, played for Queens, uh, played Queens football for, for seven years or so this was back in the days and the when well, you can keep playing as long as you want it so he he played as an undergrad and then went to med school and kept playing uh and then stayed and coached there for a while so queen's football was a part of uh his life for for just about a decade and and i and i came along i came along in 1968 so they they adopted me in in 68 agreed to take me the reason why i was two months old when i was adopted is that they went on a playoff run that nobody expected and ultimately won the vanier cup that year in 1968 and they said to cas look we're, we can't take this kid to the football season so they assumed that they'd get knocked out and be able to take me just about when i came out but they had to tell them to hold off um, and they ultimately won the championship. So I, I grew up around this, this uh, legacy of the 68 Bandy Cup Queens football team. And, and, and so that love of football uh, combined with uh, academics, you know, my dad being in, in med school at the time and going on to be a doctor and learning how to uh, have that balance uh, in life. Uh, my dad plays guitar. He 
he is an avid reader. Uh, he, he ran every day for just about his entire life, uh, football, uh, uh, doctor, traveling the world, all those things uh, it, are, are really what uh, has, has made me who I am today. What is the most important lesson that you would share with other people? Uh, the, 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 the lesson that I push all the time. I do a lot of talks, I, I, whether it's businesses or high schools or university kids, football teams, doesn't matter. And, and the thing that I push all the time is uh, we all have a certain amount of potential. Um, and uh, it's not true that we all have the same unlimited potential. It's not true. Uh, the reality is that we all carry with us a certain amount of potential. And it, it is um, my life's goal to achieve as much of that potential that I have for myself and to help those around me achieve as much of their potential as they can. And so I try to push that message all the time. It's, it's not about, uh, you know, I, I, I can play in the NBA. I can play in the NFL. I can be a, a master musician. Uh, lots of us, most of us can't do those things, but we all do have a certain amount of potential and achieving the maximum amount of potential is to me uh, the greatest joy in life. What would you say is the biggest factor that led you to where you are today? Um, I, I would, I, I would say gr growing up in that. Well, so first of all, as Doug Hargraves, who was my head coach uh, at Queens uh, was famous for saying uh, a good choice of parents uh, is what dictates most of where you're going to go. And by that, he meant your DNA. Uh, so I, I was fortunate enough to, to be an athlete and I was born an athlete but I was also fortunate enough to be in an environment where I could achieve my potential as an athlete and as a student. I had parents and I had friends and I had siblings who helped push me and guide me on my journey, which is ultimately my journey. Uh, uh, but you, you have to have that helping hand. And, and that is, it, it's that environment that I grew up in that has been uh, the reason why I'm where I am today. So in a way it's both nature and nurture, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, it, it is every time. It's never one. It's never just the other. It is, it is a combination of those two things and recognizing that, recognizing that, oh, I had a terrible upbringing. I got terrible parents. So I'm just going to give up or, uh, you know, I'm, 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 I'm born short. I'm born slow. I'm born. So you can blame it on things. You can constantly uh, point to things that aren't ideal to allow you to succeed. Or you can say, okay, this is, this is, this is, this is a hand I was dealt. Now I'm going to try to win as much as I can with this, with this hand that I've got. What would people be most surprised to learn about you? Um, probably that, um, I, I have a, a d very deep seated, uh, rock star fantasy. Okay. So <laughs> let's hear it. Uh, yeah, no, I just, that, you know, music is, is, uh, uh, you know, you talk about potential. Um, I, I, I'm, a, I'm an okay musician. I've been playing guitar since I was 15 years old. I've been writing songs since I was 17. Um, I've written dozens of songs and recorded them. Um, and I've been on stage and performed um, whenever, you know, certainly uh, playing professional football for as long as I did allowed me to be in situations where, well, Jock Climby's here. I heard he plays guitar. Come up on stage. Here's a guitar. Let's go. Um, and I got to live out that rock star fantasy, uh, on many nights in, in various bars or various stages. Um, but, uh, I, I, I do not have the natural ability to, to make that a career, but that's, uh, that's what I wish I could do. <laughs> just, unfortunately, no matter how much, uh, no matter how hard I try, it's just, no, it's just not, that's just not, uh, was never going to be, uh, my, my vocation. At least you got to do that much though. That's pretty cool. Oh, and that's, and that's what I say. I mean, I, I feel inc so incredibly fortunate that, uh, so here I have this, this fantasy, this dream, this passion that I don't have a lot of natural talent for. And yet I have been up on stage in front of thousands of people and played guitar and sang, uh, and with an incredible band around me. Um, so I, I've, I've way overachieved. What's your secret talent 
and I guess you can't say guitar because it's not a secret if you've been in front of thousands of people. <laughs> well, um, I, I, I would say it still relates to music. I mean, I, I actually do think I have a talent for songwriting. I just don't have a talent for singing. Um, uh, I have a 15-year-old daughter who's an incredibly talented singer and, a, and starting to become a very talented songwriter. Her first song she ever wrote was better than the 30th song I ever wrote. Um, but she sang a couple of my songs and all of a sudden it, 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 it opens up this, this, this experience that I, I, I never, no one ever heard me sing that song and thought it was any good. Somebody who has a good sing, a song, a good voice, uh, knows how to, uh, to take a song and, 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 and give it that, that feel, uh, suddenly turns that song into something. Um, I, I happen to be reading a, um, uh, a, a a book on Fleetwood Mac at the moment, and uh, Stevie Nicks had that has that quality. I mean, many many of the greats do, but it's you know it, she she can take a pretty average song, and the, the way just the way she sings it all of a sudden gives it something. So I, I do actually think it's a it's a that's a bit of a hidden talent, but it's really hidden because people have said I you know my songs are good, but no one ever has encouraged me to quit law, quit football, and go into music. That's pretty cool having your daughter sing songs that you wrote, though. That's awesome. It's been it's been a blast. I've been, we've been writing songs together. She's been singing my songs. Uh, you know, we've been playing her songs. We've been recording her songs. Uh, it's it's been an absolute pleasure. What's your boldest prediction for the future? Uh, I, I would say my boldest prediction is that all three of my children are going to be okay. You know, it, it, it might sound a bit silly, but uh, it, it's it, anyone with, with teenage kids, I, well, any kids, I'd say, you know, who have not yet uh, gotten out there into the world. Um, it, we're all filled with angst. We're all filled with uncertainty and the unknown of whether they're going to be or they're, they're going to be OK. But uh, after, you know, I've got they're, they're 13, 15 and 18 and um, they have all got their strengths and their weaknesses. Uh, and I worry about them every day. But my bold prediction is that they're all going to be okay. I hope that's right. And I'm sure it will be. What has been a recent epiphany for you? Maybe something about which you've changed your mind? Uh, yeah, um, I was thinking about this and, and I suddenly realized what it is. Um, and you said you want to dig deep. So we're going to go deep here, Mark. Okay, uh, I'm ready. But um, and I, I don't know, maybe people will think this is obvious. It, it wasn't obvious to me, but, um, you know, when the, when the George Floyd thing happened um, and the world just seemed to be uh, on fire uh, and, and, and Trump and, and everything that goes along with that and, and the virus. And, and I, it, the, the epiphany has been that, uh, well, let's, let's have a look at human trajectory and, and, and let's, let's all just take a breath here and understand what's actually happening, which is that we are on an evolutionary path. And you know, all you have to do is think back to thousands of years ago and the way human beings treated their, treated each other. And you think about you know, the, the fact that the Romans had gladiators in, 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 in stadiums killing each other for sport. You have the medieval uh, ages with its barbarity and, and brutality and, and the world wars and the Holocaust and and you just go through the ages and you you and then you start to think about the last number of decades, which is just a speck in the evolution of, of human human beings. But there is no question that as human beings, we are becoming kinder, more thoughtful, more peaceful uh, uh, and better to each other and better to 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 the in the, in the animals on this planet. Um, and not necessarily the environment, but we now are, are starting to understand that a little better, but we're becoming better to each other. And, and when things like the George Floyd things happen and, and, the, and, the, and the Donald Trumps happen, it, it, it's, very, it's very easy to think that we're slipping back into something that seems uh, untenable. But when you compare those events and these types of people to Hitler, to Genghis Khan, to Stalin, and then just keep going back in history. I mean, we we are we are we are moving down a pathway, and we need to keep moving down the pathway. We need to keep moving. Donald Trump was a step backwards. We need to m keep moving forward so that people can understand that that is not where we want to go to. We do not want to move back to there. 
seeing what happened to George Floyd is another example of how we do not want to be in a world where that happens. So we all need to take steps to ensure that that, that becomes part of the history books, not part of the everyday reality that it has been for 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 decades. I mean, slavery was was only, you know, a, a couple hundred years ago. And, and so we, we need to remember that we we are all uh, as a as a species evolving and that we have to keep pushing and we have to keep the eye on the prize. But let's not lose sight of the fact that we have come a long way. That's a great perspective. I want to come back to that in a, in a few minutes. Uh, final question in this round, what book are you most likely to recommend to other people? Is there a book that's had a big impact on you? Uh, well, th there, there is a book that I, that I read a couple of years ago that, uh, that did have a big impact on me, um, more so because of how it got me thinking. Um, it's a book called The Ways of the Superior Man, uh, and many people haven't heard of it. Uh, but it, it's a book that was written, I believe, in the 70s. Um, and uh, it's, it's uh, it, it, going through a divorce and it starts to me uh, with yourself. You know, so it, lots of us in relationships, uh, when things aren't going well, are very quick to point the finger at the other person and say, well, they're not doing this, they're not doing that, and it's their fault this, and their fault that. And so I went through a period, you know, thankfully, where I started saying, okay, I got to start with myself. I got to start with who I am and... Uh, what's my role in all this and what can I do to, to try to make this work? And that process of, of turning their focus inwards rather than constantly looking for blame outwards led me to this book, and, uh, uh, which was a really interesting journey into one person's, anyway, a theory about what it is to be a man um, and what it is to be a superior man in the sense of uh, understanding the differences between men and women and um, how to rejoice uh, in those differences and how to um, love who you're with despite those differences um, and not just despite them because of those differences. Um, so it really turned uh, the whole male female dynamic on its head for me uh, and, and people who read this book and I've referred it to lots of friends, lots of people really embrace it and understand why I, I was so fascinated by it. Other people ran the other way uh, screaming um, uh, because they, they just they didn't get it or didn't, didn't understand it. But uh, anyway, that's just a book that, uh, as I said, it's, it's, it's probably slightly outdated and just the way it, it comes at you and frames things. But boy, does it, does it shake up a lot of the uh, uh, perceptions and assumptions that we make about men, women, and relationships. Interesting. I'd like to hear more about that. Jock, thank you for answering all those questions. We're going to take a quick break. And in just a moment, we'll start digging deep with Jock Climbing. We're just going to take a quick break so I can tell you a little bit more about the presenting sponsor of Digging Deep, ZenBooks. ZenBooks is Canada's go-to cloud accounting firm. They are not your typical accounting firm. I know the founders, Colin and Eric. I've worked with them for several years. And here's why I think you should consider working with them too. First of all, they bring a fresh, unique, modern approach to what is a very old-fashioned industry. These guys were working remotely and in the cloud long before it became cool. ZenBooks also uses technology to your advantage. I think this is really important. They give you the tools and analysis you need to monitor your business in real time. That's so valuable right now when everything changes so quickly. Yes, they're a virtual accounting firm, but that doesn't mean they're offshore and it doesn't mean they're inattentive. ZenBooks combines the efficiency and effectiveness of a cloud accounting service with all the benefits that you'd want from a trusted advisor, high level advice and strategic support. Now, here's what I think is going to happen if you work with ZenBooks. You'll probably start out taking advantage of their cutting-edge cloud accounting solutions. But in the long run, I think you'll stay with them because of their strategic guidance and problem-solving. Among their core values, they specifically list being candid and proactive. Isn't that exactly what you want from a trusted advisor? Look, even if you're already working with an accountant or a bookkeeper or you have some accounting staff on your team. I think you should still talk to ZenBooks 
and learn more about their tools and their expertise. Check out ZenBooks at zenbooks.ca. That's zenbooks.ca. Digging Deep is all about helping you make better decisions, and so is Abacus Data. Most leaders struggle to connect with and engage their audiences. Why is that? It's because they aren't sure how they think and feel and how they will react. Abacus Data can give you the strategic insights you need to make better decisions and to make them confidently. Here's a good example. A major national union was recently negotiating a new agreement for its thousands of members. This had the potential to be a very difficult process. There were many competing interests. So they brought in Abacus Data to conduct thorough and detailed research of their members to learn exactly where they stood, what they were thinking, what they wanted. And as a result, they were able to secure a strong new deal that was accepted overwhelmingly in a national vote. Abacus Data helps all of its clients understand what's really happening in the minds of their employees, clients, and stakeholders. They help them avoid costly blind spots. And they're really good at what they do. In fact, Abacus Data was one of the most accurate pollsters in the 2019 Canadian federal election. Make the one decision that will improve all of your other decisions. Let Abacus Data help you move forward with confidence and clarity. Go to abacusdata.ca. That's abacusdata.ca. Jock, once again, thank you for being with us. I really appreciate your time. And you've shared already so much about your life story. And I wanted to ask you about your experience being adopted, because I've reflected many times on what some people call the birthright lottery or the ovarian lottery or the genetic lottery, the fact that who we are born to has such an impact on the course of our lives. And in your case, you, you experienced the genetic lottery and then you experienced the adoption lottery effectively. You, and your, the, the, I think it's safe to say that your future was, was enormously impacted by your parents choosing to adopt you. So how do you reflect on that? Because your life could have gone in so many different directions depending on who your parents were, right? Yeah, uh, without without a doubt, um, it's just another example of the the nature nurture piece. Um, I was fortunate enough to find my birth mother uh, back in 1998. Uh, it was it was quite by happenstance. It's a long story um, that we may have to have a whole other podcast for at some point if you decide to ever do a, 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 a birth parent re- reuniting uh, podcast. But um, uh, suffice it to say, uh, it wasn't a, a deep-seated need uh, in, in me to find my birth mother or my birth father, but I had a friend who did have that need. She wanted uh, uh, someone to 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 join her in the in the search. It is a search. It is a it is a almost like an investigative process. Uh, it felt like Sherlock Holmes trying to piece all the things together in order to to, to find my my birth um, mother at the time. Um, anyway, she went through it because she needed to. I went through it because I was curious. When she found her birth mother, I stopped. Two years later, I found my file that I'd started. I thought, you know, it might be kind of fun just to see this thing through. And anyway, wound up finding my birth mother in 1998. Turned out she was at that point 50 years old, living in Kelowna, wonderful, happy life, uh, joyful reunion, uh, extended family, the whole bit. Met the father side, not the father, but met the birth father side of the family. Um, a wonderful relationship for them. So it all worked out really well. But it, it was uh, a real uh, study in contrast to 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 look at their life, the the the, the, the um, and, and imagine what my the trajectory of my life might have been like had they decided not to give me up. Um, they were both young, uh, or early or late teens, early twenties. And and made an an, an incredibly um, selfless decision uh, at the time. They actually stayed together for for many years after that, and then broke up. But I I thank my lucky stars every day that they did that because I I wound up with a family that gave me every opportunity and every experience that I I simply would not have had. I had stability. I had, uh, uh, I had a rich environment uh, to learn and to be exposed to different experiences. And 
uh, and yet they're wonderful people. And, and, um, you know, I'm sure, I'm sure things would have been okay, but I wouldn't be the person that I am today if I hadn't been adopted by, uh, you know, these wonderful people who just believed even at the, like who, who can believe it? Like 25 years old decided it's time to start giving back. My dad was barely out of med school. They had no money and they decided it was time to start giving back. Um, and, and I, I have my life to thank for that. And part of the way they gave back was to adopt a, a black baby, which, as you pointed out earlier, was uh, was a much more unusual thing at that time, right? Yeah, it, it, it was. It's it was. It's interesting how today, you know, if you're if you're in the market for 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 a baby in Canada, uh, you know, they, they, it, they're they're pretty hard to come by. Uh, um, it, I, my parents have told me, my mother worked for CES at the time. She said healthy white babies were hard to come by in the late sixties too. But you start talking about black and Asian and uh, babies who might have some congenital defect or some possible health problems. And all of a sudden, you know, you could just, you could pick one up <laughs> anytime. Um, and so for them to specifically say, we will go and, 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 and take somebody that probably other people don't want, uh, is pretty special. Um, and then, you know, there's, there's, there's what, what came with that, what came with that is that, uh, you know, I'm a black baby being adopted into an all white family in an all white neighborhood and an all white school and an all, you know, for all sorts of purposes, an all white world. Uh, most of the schools I went to, um, you know, until I got the, until I got the Glebe collegiate in grade 12, uh, you know, I was, I was almost always the only black kid in the entire school. So, uh, you know, that came with its own set of challenges. Yeah, what was that experience like? And and what you know, tell me a little bit about what it was like for your family. Were there experiences you went through where your you know your behaving, your functioning as a family, you you all think of yourself as a family, but other people looking in, especially at that time, might have made their own judgments or or said certain things, that kind of thing. What was that whole experience like? Yeah, lots lots of lots of family stories that that we still all laugh about. Um, uh, to this day, uh, it, it, I mean, the, the the first thing uh, I suppose uh, that that springs to mind is just the way uh, my family uh, uh, built a built a a defense system around me. Um, uh, I, we encountered lots of racism uh, through the years. Um, uh, we lived in Germany. Kids would go by our house and chant uh, the N word, uh, and my two brothers, who would be like six and nine would chase them down the street, um, you know, uh, throwing stones at them as they'd run away. Um, it, there was just, there was, there was an immediate sense that I was vulnerable, um, wherever we went. And so despite the fact that I had the normal relationship that you have with siblings, not always, uh, not always smooth, um, uh, not always kind, uh, but Boy, what, you know, they, they, we, we circled the wagons whenever uh, we were any of us were, uh, were under threat, and I was often a target as a result of that. Um, my uh, and my parents had some some challenges too. I mean, you know, you're walking down the middle of the street with you know four kids, and one of them's black, <laughs> and people are, what's this? What what's happening here? Um, I, I refused to have uh, my mother um, uh, cut my hair, uh, uh, comb my hair. I looked like buckwheat for most of the most of the years growing up, and my mother would get literally stopped in the middle of the street by black women who would be haranguing her and yelling at her about the fact that she's not taking care of me because my hair is just out of control. Um, and she would just say, "Talk to him. <laughs> like, he won't let me anywhere near his hair. So <laughs> you got to lay off me, lady." Um, so anyway, lots of those sorts of funny stories, uh, but uh, certainly that that feeling of there. there I mean, four, four kids ended up being five. We ended up, my parents ended up adopting a fifth when we were all in our teens and, and they decided to give a five-year-old a chance that, that otherwise wouldn't have had much of a chance. Um, so, you know, five kids, three of whom were adopted. Th th there was a pretty strong message, um, you know, both inside the family and to the world that adopted, not adopted, we're, 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 all, we're all siblings and we're all part of, part of this family. We're all loved equally. And, and, and we projected that, I think, wherever we went, and we, we, we'd get that reflected back to us. People saw that immediately, realized who, lots of people who don't understand adoption, don't understand how you can take these a child into your home that you're not even related to and, and now instantly love them and care for them like you're your own. We showed a lot of people, I think, over the years um, just how that's done.
That's really heartwarming and inspiring and powerful. And uh, it's a real credit to your parents, obviously. That's it's really special. Absolutely. And, you know, it, you talked earlier about the evolutionary path and how we're all better to each other. And while, uh, uh, you know, I, I'm, a, I'm a bit of an optimist about things. And so as much as I acknowledge all of the challenges that we're facing and, and I realize that, that there are lots of problems in our society that have not been solved and that there's a disproportionate impact uh, that those problems create on people of color and on women and on people in developing countries and so many other disadvantaged people in the world, I do believe that life is better today than it ever has been before. It can still be better than that. But uh, it, it strikes me that your story is an example of that, that there is, there are more families like your family today than there would have been in the seventies. And there were more families in the seventies like that than there were in the forties and fifties. And, and that that's the, the direction we're going on, even though there are sometimes challenges and missteps along the way. Without a doubt. Uh, I, I think about, uh, <clears throat> my own experience, um, uh, dating, the dating in my dating life. And, and obviously I've, I've only had white women around me, white girls around me. I dated white girls. Um, and, uh, uh, the, I, I get looks, I mean, in the, you know, in the, in the seventies, if I was, you know, holding hands with a, with a girl, uh, there'd be, be, you know, what's going on here. I, I, I don't think people, I don't, I never think of it. It doesn't even occur to me. And I don't know that it occurs to anybody else. Um, that's progress. Um, and, uh, while I, I might, if I saw a family walking down the street and I saw four kids and one was black and everybody else was white, I, I, I might go, oh, I wonder what's going on there. But, you know, I, I, what I do think is that there's, there, that, that same amount of judgment is, is it, we, we, we have started to move past that in Canada in particular, I, I'm not, uh, I'm not going to speak for other countries, and I certainly wouldn't speak for the U.S. on that front. But it, it, I think it's I think it is slowly getting better. And now now we're now we're at a we're, we're at a different phase. Um, and uh, I was on a call just um, this morning as I prepare for a uh, a legal uh, conference, an annual legal conference, and I'm part of a panel um, that is on diversity, and it's uh, the panel is is all black lawyers who who are going to talk about their experiences. And uh, it, that that discussion just it just reminds me of of what you know really what the George Floyd push has 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 brought to our society, which is a focus on it's no longer enough to just say I'm not racist because I don't think less of black people or I don't think less of Asian people or whatever. It's what am I doing to 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 build that part of our society. And I, and I just think about the, the indigenous people in Canada, you know, really, I just, I wish there was more focus put brought to bear there because, you know, there's, there's, there are so many opportunities to try and help raise people up. It's not enough to say, I don't discriminate against them. I don't hold it against you. What am I doing to help the, the, the segments of our society, which are underprivileged, underrepresented um uh where that gap between the rich and the poor is at its starkest what are we doing to ameliorate that situation not what are we doing to encourage it it's not enough anymore to just say well i'm not doing anything to make that worse what are you doing to make it make, to make it better yeah i agree and um there is you're right it's not enough anymore it's it's uh, it is about taking action and acknowledging the the systemic barriers not just it's not about opportunity anymore it's about um creating equality taking action to to cause equality and equity in the world um i want to come back to what you said about your life story dream doubt commit succeed can you talk more about that yeah. So, um, you know, it, it really does go back to that four or five year old little kid that uh, I can still remember people coming up and saying, oh, hey, little jock, what, what do you want to do when you grow up? And, you know, people would say, I want to be a firefighter. I want to be a policeman. I want to be a doctor or whatever. And and, uh, and I would literally say, I want to play for Queens football and I want to play in the CFL. And and people would have that kind of little funny laugh. Oh, I was such a cute kid. And 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 then um, I, you know, we spent eight years in Europe. I mean, from the time I was five to the time I was uh, 15, we, I was only in Canada for two years. So 
Uh, there was no opportunity to play football. All I wanted to do was play football. I begged my parents to get back to Canada so I could play football. Um, and they said, sorry, we're, we're, we're following our own dream. We have a dream of, of living in Europe and skiing in the Alps every weekend and, and getting the Volkswagen camper and, and, you know, taking our kids all over, all over the continent and, and, you know, football, like, like, so what? Like, we know you want to do that, but it's not like you're going to go anywhere with it. So like, who cares? Um, and my mother, I was a small kid. My mother to this day talks about how she tried to, you know, I mean, encourage me, but also keep me realistic. Look, you talk to you, this tiny, skinny little kid, like you're probably not going to be a football player. So let's focus on school instead. And, and I, my, I, 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 I lost that dream. I mean, I, I, I still wanted to play, but I, your reality takes hold and, uh, I, if you're asking me when I was 12, what I was going to do, I wouldn't have told you I was playing at the CFL. That was the furthest pos thing possible because I wasn't even playing football yet. Whereas like, all of my friends back in Canada, I've been playing football since organized football since they were eight, nine, 10 years old. Um, but I got back to, 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 to Ottawa, went to Glee, walked up to the head coach said, can I try out? Look, coach looks at some skinny kid that's uh, going to be broken in half by one tackle, but sees a black kid. So assumes I'm fast. So says, sure, you can come out. Didn't see the field. Did, I mean, so you talk about doubt, right? So I finally get a chance to put on a helmet and shoulder pads and be part of a team. They did not let me touch the field. I mean, I wound up being, you know, a 12 year uh, uh, football player in the CFL. Nobody else from Glebe's ever done that. And they sat me on the bench the whole year. Do I blame them? Absolutely not. I wasn't ready to play. And they didn't, they didn't see the potential that you know, I didn't see in myself. So I doubted, I doubted me. They doubted me all for good reason. There was no reason at that point to believe that I was going to turn out to be the football player that I did. And then I got my opportunity because everybody graduated. They had no choice. They started throwing the football to me. I started catching. I started scoring touchdowns and sort of the rest of his, his history. But that's what I mean about sort of the, 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 the dream, the doubt, the commit, work hard, you know, do all the things that you need to do in order to achieve that goal and then, and then get there. And I can, I can tell that story uh, with many things. I can tell that story with women, you know, that I've dated or married or kids or my job with law. I mean, I could tell this same story and it doubt I put that in there on purpose because it's, I mean, every time that ball came in the air and I was running down the field and there's three thirty thousand 30,000 fans screaming, I doubted where I could catch that ball. And then I'd make that decision that I'm going to do everything in my power to get that ball. And that's sort of the way I, I, I think about, um, the, uh, the, the way I move through life is, is those four words. So what changed and how were you able to overcome that doubt and overcome the fact that you didn't play football growing up? You know, you look at the hockey world and it's today, it's almost like if you're a kid in Ontario and you're not a star by the time you're 11, you're, you, there's no chance of you going anywhere in professional hockey. Uh, it, it, so how did you turn that around without having the experience of growing up in the game? And how did you overcome the doubt in particular? Yeah, so so football is different. You, you, I could never have been a foot a hockey player um, uh, because I, you know, I I played it sporadically, um, and I I that I played hockey's my passion certainly has been since I was probably you know twenty. Um, that's what I play recreationally. Uh, since before COVID, I was playing it three times a week. Um, football was my passion as well, but then it became my job. So uh, once I retired from football, I wasn't out throwing the football around on, and playing touch football on weekends. So that was that, that, I did that a couple of times. <laughs> I was just like, that reminds me too much of work. Um, but hockey is one of those sports. If you're not skating by the time you're five or six, you're not going to make it to the NHL. That's just, that's just the reality. Football is different. That's why it's one of the reasons why it's a wonderful sport. If you have great athleticism, great drive, train really hard, you can succeed even if you start at – at 17 or 18 that's uh, more unusual that way but it's possible but um the way i uh i believe have um come to accept and thrive it, it, under the, those those conditions of doubt is to accept the doubt and i talked i talk a lot about this when i do these sort of um talks is 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 how important it is to embrace and confront the doubts that you have many of us are, are more much more prone to to running from it we either we either want to ignore it pretend it's not there um we don't want to talk about our fears we don't want to talk about 
uh, uh, the, the doubts that we have in ourselves or the doubts that other people clearly have about in us. Um, we don't want to talk about, it, we don't want to think about it. And so you don't confront it. And if you don't confront it, you're not going to be able, you're not going to be able to overcome it. And so it was this something that was going on in my head. Um, but clearly it worked for me was to say, okay, it's there. I'm, I'm not going to pretend it's not. And here's all these kids that have been playing football since they were nine. Here I am, you know, just don't even know how to put my shoulder pads on properly. Okay. So I'm scared and I don't think I'm going to be any good. And they don't think I'm going to be any good. Uh, one of my best friends um, uh, still to this day uh, at, at, at that in the year in grade 13, we're already friends at this point. We're just becoming friends. They have no choice but to play me. He's a captain of the team. He's the starting safety. He goes to the head coach and he says, I'm going to play both ways so we don't have to play the jock because he's not good enough. Um, and tried to convince the coach to let him play both ways. That's how little faith they had in me. Um, and yeah, that, that, that just motivates me. That's just, you know, he told me that story much later uh, uh, laughing about it, but that, that's the sort of thing that you have to, you have to internalize, you have to confront, you have to recognize it, and you have to, you have to work extremely hard to now overcome that. Interestingly though, I think what, what I find fascinating about your story is you were, you were playing long odds, right? You're in a way your mom was right that it, it was a long shot for you to end up being a professional football player, given that you were living in Europe and not playing football when you were a, a teenager and you, you came back to Canada and, and kind of walked onto the football field in high school that, that this was a, an incredible long shot, right? So you were, you were playing very long odds. Without a doubt. And, uh, that, that goes to another one of my theories in life. Uh, you know, I could have, I could have gone, gone with this as well in terms of, uh, the way I, the way I think about, um, life and an epiphany about life, which is that life is really just a series of odds. Um, everything you do, um, every day is just a question of odds. It's, you know, whether you get hit by a car when you, when you go out, whether you uh, get that job interview, whether you uh, meet that girl and she likes you and you like whatever it is, you, it, it's, it's all a series of odds. When I talk about maximizing your potential, it's only a question of maximizing the chance or, or, or of increasing your odds, improving your odds. It's like, it's no different than a, 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 when you get dealt uh, a hand in poker. You could be dealt the worst hand, but you can still win the hand. It's all about what you do with that hand. Now, if you get really good cards, your chance of winning the hand are way better than if you have terrible cards, but you always have a chance. You're always in the game. I was, I had very long odds without a, without a doubt, but I, I, I increased my odds. First of all, because of my good choice of parents, I was born relatively fast. I suddenly grew up to be six foot one. My mother thought I was going to be five foot nine. I suddenly spurred it up. I was six one. Um, I was, I wasn't ever really fast, but I was fast enough. And I had, you know, what turned out to be pretty remarkable hand eye coordination as a receiver. So I was born with certain gifts and then I, I took that and I applied it and I, and I was able to, to focus. I mean, I think what, what people have, have, have remarked about me, I guess, over the years is my ability. And when it's time to focus, I just, I, everything else disappears. And I, and so you take these skills, you develop these skills, um, you work hard and now you improve your odds. You don't, there's no guarantees. And it just drives me crazy when I see people with a sense of self entitlement who think, well, I've done a, B and C and therefore D should follow. That's not how it works. All you've done by doing a, B and C is improve the odds that D is going to happen, but it's not guaranteed it. And so there were long, there were, there were long odds, but the, I, I shrunk those odds every single day uh, from a football standpoint. I shrunk those odds every single day from the time I stepped onto that football field when I was 15 years old. Yeah. And you, you talked about potential and how we all have a certain amount of potential and we all, I think uh, you didn't say this, but I, what I, what I hear in that as well is that we all have different potential, right? And there is a, there is a little bit of a mythology sometimes I think that, uh, any child can grow up to do anything. And that is probably not true, right? In fact, I'm sure it's not true. Uh, I was not going to play in the CFL, even if that was my dream. Uh, you know, not every kid can grow up to be an entrepreneur or a doctor or a lawyer or uh, a ballerina or a musician. That's not the way it works. But you you work with what you've got. And as you said, you work every day to increase your odds of being successful at whatever it is 
um, for which you have the greatest potential and the greatest ambition, right? And you're, you're absolutely preaching to the choir. Um, I, I get really frustrated when I hear people say, you can be anything you want. It's not true. It's not true. I mean, having a, having a daughter in dance, uh, I'll, I'll never forget seeing that. I, I'd go watch her, her and her, you know, her, her, her dance troupe dancing and, you know, nine years old, 10 years old. And you see a big bone girl um, who can't jump off the ground because she doesn't have that sort of athleticism. And you just, you know, it's not about whether she could lose weight or not. She just doesn't have the bone structure that will make her a great jazz dancer or, or ballerina. It's not possible for her to go on to, get a scholarship or whatever and, 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 and be a dancer for the rest of her life. It's just not true. Um, my daughter had that body, interestingly enough, but we could tell right away that she did not have the natural gift. And she, I remember her telling me when she was 13 years old, she says, daddy, I don't have it. Like I can just look around the room and I can see who might maybe have has it. I don't have it. Uh, and I said, I'm great. To, I'm really happy to hear you say that, honey. Cause that's, 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 that's a fact. There are some things that you need to have. It's like to be a football player, uh, you have to be, uh, if you're, if you're small, you better be fast. If you're not small and you're not fast, you better be really big. Um, and you better have great, uh, foot speed and, uh, great toughness. So there's things that you need to have. It's not true that every, anybody can be a football player, despite the fact that football lends itself to just about everybody's shape and size and, and ability. And that's and that and that one of the reasons why I love football is that in so many ways it is like a, a microcosm of life, in that you have all these different positions who do all such very different things and needs different strengths and and can afford to have certain weaknesses and still be good in it, uh, and, and they, they all have to work together in order to achieve a goal, and 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 that's so much of what life is about as well. So it it, it is I think really an important message to tell young people. I don't mean just kids. I mean, people in their twenties. No, you can't, you can't be whatever you want to be. Uh, but if you have a passion for something and you have some natural ability at something, you have an opportunity through hard work, dedication, commitment to improving the chances that you will achieve the, whatever dreams that you have within, within that, um, within that sphere. And, uh, and you need to reach out and get help and support to enable, you can't just do it all yourself. You need to also figure out a way to solicit that support around you so that you give yourself the best odds you can possibly get in order to get where you want to get to. So how does that tie into your decision to go to law school at the same time as you were a professional football player? Uh, because uh, there were a lot of people, I think, who would have seen that as a an either or sort of scenario. You're either going to play for professional football or you're going to go to law school. Um, and, and you found a way to do both. I think you might have even been the first person allowed to kind of go to, to Queen's Law School part time or something like that. They made a they made an exception for you. Why was that so important to you? at that time? And, and how did you balance that? Because those are two very demanding ventures at the same time. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm uniquely, I think, proud of, of the fact that I was able to do that. Uh, but I, I, I think it's incredibly important. And we're having this discussion about the odds. Um, it, it's really important to give a nod to Lady Luck in, in all of this, right? So that's, so you, that's why we talk about odds. So if you've got a two and five chance, then you're going to have to be lucky in order to achieve the, the, the two out of the five. And so, um, uh, so I, I had some luck. One was that law school, uh, still to this day, and certainly back then, you, you needed to do your first year of law school from September through to April. After that, it's a semester system. If I had gotten drafted in the first round or gotten drafted in the CFL at the same time that I had gotten into law school, I would have, I would have had a terrible quandary. Uh, but it turned, but I made a really good choice to get out of economics after three years, go to law school, get one year law school of in, which was my fourth year of Queens football. Now it's my draft year. And so now uh, I'm drafted. I've got that one year out of the way. So uh, a, a, a Queens player a couple of years ago called me um, for some advice out of the blue, which I just love. I, I encourage people to do this all the time. If you don't pick up the phone, you don't reach out to people you're just missing such a great opportunity. And I'm, I'm a really busy guy. I'm not saying I like it. I'm not saying I like to be getting these emails and these phone calls, which I get all the time, but I never turn it down because I know how important it is. Um, 
but this guy called me up and said, what do I do? I've just been drafted into the CFL and I want to go to law school. And so we talked, we talked it through and I ultimately encouraged him to go and do a fifth year of football, get his first year of law school in and then try the CFL the next year, which he did. Unfortunately, COVID hit and now he's not, he's not playing, but, um, I, I was lucky in the way things fell. I was then lucky to have a Dean at the time who I walked into his office and said, I just finished first year. I've just been drafted. Is there any chance you'd let me do one semester a year? And then he was like, no one's ever done that before. I was like, I know. What do you think? Uh, and he, you know, luckily he said, I, well, I don't see why not. Just, to, just because we've never done it before doesn't mean we shouldn't do it. And, you know, as years went on, it became the norm. If you were, uh, if, you know, it started accommodation, you needed it for a comment, you know, you, you're, you're, uh, you were, you were pregnant, you, you were having a baby, you needed to have this, you know, so whatever it is that became, but at that time it was like, no, there's only one way to do things. And you do three years and you're done. I took my, I did my degree over five years. Um, and I was able to combine two, two of these incredible passions at the same time. And so, you, you know, you, you ask about, well, how, how hard was that? And was that, I, I've always said this, that was the easiest thing I've ever done because I got to be a student for half the year and professional football for half the year, football player for half the year. So as long as, I mean, that, that transition, that switch over was, was tough, but, I got to experience two worlds in one, uh, and I loved it. Um, I, I loved being a student with money uh, and some, you know, notoriety, and 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 um, uh, and I and I loved being a professional football player. But I loved the idea that I was advancing my career and and building for the future. And I could get cut tomorrow in the CFL. I, I'm good. I'm not going to pump gas. I'm 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 going to get my law degree here, and I'm going to I'm going to be fine no matter what happens. And and that's something my mother taught me. She's priested all the time. Options, options, options. You've got to give yourself options. And the, the more education you have, the, 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 the more skills you have, the more options you have in life. And I have preached that and I have lived that uh, since that since that age, right, right then and there. That's another form of playing the odds, right? Of improving your your chances, right? Of, exactly. Yeah is giving yourself more options, right? Then more options. One, one bet doesn't work out, the other bet does, right? That sort yeah. of thing. And so, I mean, I, I, that's, that's uh, and I'm, you know, I'm hardly one to talk because I've done all these sim things simultaneously in my life as well, but that became a bit of a pattern for you because you, you went to law school and played professional football. Then you started practicing law while you were a, a professional football player. And then you, you were a full-time a lawyer and a part-time broadcaster as well, right? So this became a theme. What can you share any lessons from that in terms of how you manage that? And and were there some challenges that arose from that too? Because you were obviously incredibly busy. You had a family as well. So how did you manage through all of that? Yeah, uh, definitely uh, challenging, and it's that's not for everybody. Um, I, you know, and I and I really I've, I've made taken pains to make sure people know that I'm not running around telling everybody to, to do what I did. Um, it, it, it's in my nature. It's in my nature that I need lots of balls in the air. I need lots of things driving me and motivating me and inspiring me. And if, uh, and I was always really worried about if I was just a lawyer, just a football player, just a dad, uh, you know, if I, if I didn't have a lot of things enriching my life that I would, uh, uh, fall into some sort of malaise. Um, uh, so, uh, you know, maybe guilty of being a little too driven, but I, I did, um, I did have some, ex some interesting experiences along the way th th this, this desire, um, strong desire to combine football and law for as long as I can. Uh, really it's, uh, I, you know, I took it to an extreme. <laughs> so, you know, we had to go from 1990 all the way to, uh, 2018, you know, that's how long I, I, I earned a living in both of those arenas. Um, and I, it still it baffles me to this day how I managed it. But the, the, the one time when they really um, overlapped was in 1998 when I, uh, so I had uh, graduated from law school in 94. I'd done my articles in, in over two six month stints rather than one 12 month stint. So I'd split that up. And then I've spent the off seasons working for the Department of Justice, um, doing labor litigation or criminal litigation. But I wasn't able to get called to the bar because the bar exams were held every year from September to December, which involved being in class every single day from 9 till 1230 and writing the exam every week to two weeks. And of course, that's the middle of the CFL football season. 
and but I was really tired of not being a lawyer. It was really hard on me to see all my classmates graduate, article, get called to the bar, become lawyers. And every year that goes on, they're one more, they're, they're, they're called, they're, they're, they're a second year lawyer, they're a third year lawyer, they're a fourth year lawyer. Meanwhile, I'm treading water. I'm nowhere. I'm nothing. I'm not an American student. I'm not a lawyer. Um, and I was really frustrated. So I was going to retire. I was at the top of my game in the CFL. I'd had back to back all star seasons. Um, and I, I was going to retire because I was so frustrated by, by this being in limbo. And Jim Pop, the general manager of the Alouettes, heard this in a, heard me interview, uh, uh, ruminating about the possibility of retirement. He called me up and he said, do not retire. We'll find a way for you to play for us and write your bar exams. And I said, Jim, it's impossible. The bar exams are held in Ottawa every day. And obviously I'm playing in Montreal. He says, Jock, knowing you, you'll find a way. Call me when you figure it out and you hang up. And I spent two weeks looking at schedules, plotting, planning, figuring, connecting dots, and finally thought, okay, maybe there's a way. So I called him up. I said, Jim, you're not going to like it. There's only one way this can work. And this is how, this is how it would have to work. Every day I'd have to go to class at nine o'clock in the morning. I, at, practice starts at that time started at one o'clock in Montreal. I'd have to get on my car at 1230. I'd have to hightail to Montreal, which is two, about two and a half hours to Olympic Stadium. I'd get there when meetings are over. So Jim, I'd miss all the meetings, which are part of every football player's life. I'd get there just in time to hit the field. I'd go on the field for two and a half hours with the teammates. I'd have to jump in the shower, jump back in my car, drive back to Ottawa, study every night because I haven't studied all day. I had to study for two or three hours and then go get up and do the same thing the next day and do that for two and a half months. And he said, let's do it. And I said, I can't believe you're saying that. Like, I'm going to miss meetings. I'm going to be distracted. I'm, you know, and I, plus on top of that, I got exams. So there were exams every week to two where I'm going to have to be in exams. And, the, and I said, there's one, there's one hiccup in the schedule. I have an exam on a Friday morning and there's the game in Winnipeg on that Friday night. And I said, I'd be jumping on a plane at two o'clock. I'd be landing at like four or five, or five and be on the field at seven. He's like, okay, let's do it. And that's wow. the hardest thing I've ever played in my life. I went, I, I, I went, I went on and did that. And I still, uh, to this day, don't know how I did it other than sheer force of will, but it was a incredibly grueling experience to be a professional football player. At that point, halfway through the season, I was, you know, Anthony Kavir was our quarterback. We were nine and two, we were rolling on our way to the great, what we hoped was going to be a great cup. And all of a sudden this started. And uh, while Pop had endorsed this and the media was, in, you know, all over this, this was a huge story across the country that I was doing this. Uh, Dave Ritchie, the head coach, was not a fan of this at all. It was like, over his objections. And I was pretty soon relegated to a wide receiver position where Tracy Ham never threw the ball. It was Tracy Ham and Anthony Cabello at the time. Never threw the ball out there. And I went from catching, you know, I was, I was like number three or four in the league and receiving when, at, at that Labor Day point. And, you know, within five weeks, I was catching one ball a game. If I was lucky, people forgot who I was on the team. Media was saying this is a disaster. He's going to hit hurt in the team. There's all kinds of negative stories. In the meantime, I'm trying to get, you know, stay in class and write these exams and pass. And you fail. There's nine exams. You fail one. Hold it. It's done. You can't you can't fail one exam. It's like you, your whole you have to wait till the next year. So the pressure was off the charts. And, and then there was this amazing moment where we're in Toronto. We're probably six games into this, this, this thing. And, and, and Tracy Hams looked across the locker room at me. And, and it was like, he saw that. I remember that I was, I was his leading receiver just a, you know, a few months before. And anyway, he went out there, started throwing me the football. I dropped the first one. I was so surprised he threw it to me, um, kept feeding me the ball, wound up with seven catches, two touchdowns, 150 yards. And all of a sudden I was, back on the team and back part of the offense and wound up in the East final. I had 11 catches for over hundred yards. And I, we lost that game in a dying second field goal, 53 yards, no time on the clock. I had to get on the train. Everybody else is in the locker room, you know, crying and, you know, just having a terrible time and then able to go out and be together. I had to get on a train, take the train back to Ottawa, got in at like midnight and was writing an exam the next morning at nine for three and a half hours. And wow. so those sorts of experiences, um, have stayed with me. It's that ability to, if you put your mind to it, you know, just about anything's possible. Incredible. I can't imagine the pressure of all of that uh, during that time. Um, I wanted to talk to you about your experience. We, we talked about your experience uh, being black in a white family growing up. What was your experience as a, as a black professional athlete? And what has been your experience as a black lawyer, um, and and just can you describe what those two worlds have been like for you? 
Well, I'll, I'm going to tell you a story about what it was like to be a black Canadian athlete in the CFL, which will probably surprise you. Um, uh, so when I think about what, when I think about being black and being a professional athlete, uh, I immediately think about uh, what was the real challenge. The real challenge is being on a team where you had white Canadians, black Canadians, white Americans, black Americans, and then in Montreal, we also had a, a gang of francophones, five or four, four to six francophones, uh, most of whom were white. And uh, I, uh, it, it, I mean, in many ways, it was like the UN, I suppose. But the the the, the tensions uh, were real, and the challenges uh, for me were pronounced. Um, I look black, but I sound white. Because I was raised in a white family, it's not my fault. Uh, black Americans would come up. Lots of these guys from the deep south, they 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 had no idea what to make of me, and a lot of them did dislike me intensely. They 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 they. I mean, these are guys who who grew up in some very difficult neighborhoods, surrounded by black people who spoke and acted just like them, and only to meet now to meet me, who's a lawyer, and speaks the way I do. Um, and they thought I was kind of some kind of sellout, and, uh, and so 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 many of them would reject me. Uh, the white Americans, well, I mean, there was a division right away in every locker room. The black the black guys sat together at the at the on the plane on the, at the at the dining room table and the in the calf and the locker room, and the white guys sat together, and the O line sat together, and the French guys sat together. Um, and so here I am. I'm not in any world, right? So I'm I'm I speak French, so I hang out with the francophones. I sound like a white guy. I'm from Canada, so I'd, I'd, I'd hang out with the white Canadians. I'm black, so I could hang out with the black guys. But so 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 fit in everywhere, fit in nowhere. And it actually took me a number of years in the CFL to finally realize uh, how the only way I was going to sort through this uh, and deal with all that tension was to forget about it and just I'm just decide I'm going to be I'm going to be me. I'm not going to try to act like a black American when I'm with them and try to act like a French guy when I'm with these guys and act like a white guy when I'm with these like I'm, I'm just going to be me and they're going to accept it and they're going to take it they're going to leave it um and that so that took me probably half probably took me six or seven years into my career before I finally got there and uh and I, I'll never forget uh, being in training camp and, and overhearing two black American guys talking and one was a veteran and one was a rookie and one the rookie was saying to the other guy like what what, what the hell was that climbing guy and he was just like giving him an earful, like, but you know, about what he thought of me. And he, then this, the veteran just said, "That's climbing. Leave him alone. He's cool." And that was just like he just, it just. And so I, so I finally realized, okay, just me being the people who knew who got to know me, learned to just stick because I'm not trying to be somebody I'm not. And that's 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 a message that I passed on. I've tried to pass on as much as I can because there's so much of that in life where we all go around trying to fit in and be part of the groups around us and these racial divisions in a CFL locker room were real. I mean, real, uh, to the, you know, to the point where people, as I said, don't, didn't sit together, didn't talk to each other. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I don't know how it is today, because that was 20 years ago, but, um, I, I hope it's gotten better, but I wouldn't be surprised if it hasn't. And it's not just color. It's also culture. The, the 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 black American culture is so different from what we experience up here in Canada, even for the black Canadians, um, and the way they talk, the way they think, um, and the way they've lived their lives. Yeah, their uh, life experience is totally different. Totally different, and and it's so hard for them. And and that, and they've they've had this opportunity, right? Every single black American that has come up to the CFL has been a star college football player. They didn't make the NFL. Here they are in the CFL, hoping to get back to the NFL. All of them know guys who've gone on to make millions in the NFL. They all have a, a certain view of life, and they've all come from a certain place in life. That is so hard for us to relate to. And I would hear their stories constantly over the years about being pulled over by cops and uh, abused by police and uh, discriminated against. It, it's experiences that I've never had. But that was that's an everyday occurrence for them back for, for them down there. So a lot of what I we are all reading and hearing about in the U.S. I experienced and lived through them, not personally. 
Um, and, and so th that's a lot of what uh, I brought to this is, is, is what I learned from those guys. What are your observations about how uh, professional sports is handling the issue of racism in North America? Because there has been, it seems to me, a significant change, even just in the last few years, there was, you know, you look at the reaction initially to Colin Kaepernick kneeling for the national anthem, and then this year, leagues making decisions to suspend games after the George Floyd incident, uh, Major League Baseball putting the Black Lives Matter logo on the field. Uh, there, there has been a significant change. That if It looked like for a time the leagues wanted nothing to do with these issues. They wanted to stay out of them, and now they're, they're getting more involved. What do you think is going on there, and what observations do you have about that? Yeah, the evolution piece that I mentioned earlier, that, that to me is what's, what's going on. I, I, I hope it's not a bandwagon issue. You know, that, that's the biggest fear that I have, that um, it's not like all these um, executives um, and owners, you know, suddenly um, uh, learn something new. Um, that, that, that's not possible. You know, these guys are old white men. They're, they're not suddenly having some sort of epiphany. Um, they're simply realizing that that part of the brand needs to needs to change, um, and that they have an opportunity. I'm not gonna, I'm not totally cynical. I think many of them understand now that they have an opportunity to advance the conversation. So allowing the NBA players to put logos on the back of their jerseys in the in the NBA playoffs, they don't have to do that, but they now realize this is an opportunity to 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 appear at least to appear like you're um part of the solution and you're pushing this 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 new message to be in sync with the community to be in sync with the with their customers right it, it's that, 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 absolutely yeah. with society is if, if north yeah. american society if you will and so whether they see it as a uh, a good idea from business perspective, whether they see it as a good idea from a societal perspective, whether they're searching their own conscience, I'll bet you the answer is different for every, for every one of them. But in some ways, I don't really care. Sometimes it's to fake it till you make it. That's, you know, that's something that I, I believe wholeheartedly as well. And so you, if you get them uh, uh, acting as though they believe in diversity and equality, eventually they'll start to believe in a, a, a diversity and equality. But, you know, pro professional sports is different. Professional sports, um, hockey with the, with the slight exception, though that's obviously changing, is dominated by black men. So it's not as though professional teams are str any str stranger to black men. Um, they're critical to their, to, to the billions of dollars that they make. So, uh, but, but so that, so many of them would say, well, we're not racist. I rub shoulders with black men every day. I've, 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 I've got teammates, white teammates who would say, I'm, I'm, I'm a professional football player. I've been like, I shower with black men every day. Well, that's, again, that's, that's, that's only half the conversation now. Now it's what are you doing to, to, to help promote and, and ensure not just that million dollar athlete is, is, is good and, and is treated fairly and equally, but what, what about the other people, you know, in his community and his societies that don't have the millions of dollars? What are you doing to help them? Um, uh, rise themselves up and, and have the same opportunities as everybody else. So I, I, I think the conversation's changing. I think that uh, it's a wonderful thing that, that, the, um, that these major uh, institutions, Major League Baseball, NBA, NFL, CFL, et cetera, uh, are, are helping to push that. Um, and, uh, and whether it's completely sincere or not is actually irrelevant. What I do care about is if it has staying power. What I don't want this to be is some sort of fad. Um, I want people to truly feel remorseful about what happened to Colin Kaepernick, understand that he was just ahead of the times, and 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 that that that's, that this notion of being able to to do the right thing and and, and not be blackballed as a result of it, um, it has to be has to be uh, they have to rid that uh, of professional sports, and I, I think we're I think we're moving in the right direction. I wanted to talk a little bit about your sister, Erin, uh, who you lost a few years ago. Um, can you tell me a little bit about that experience? You described it as being part of the, the worst year in your life so far. Naturally, it was a, a, a tragic loss. Uh, can you tell me what you and your family went through? 
Yeah, I, I, I'd never been through anything like that. Um, you know, you always hear people say, oh, it's not, it's not going to happen to you. And I, I'm, I'm sort of guilty of that. Um, it just, it, it still seemed, it was very sudden um, and uh, and extremely hard um, to have somebody who's just part of the fabric of your life suddenly ripped out of it. Uh, and, um, you know, Aaron was a very happy, outgoing, fun-loving uh, person who probably by the early 20s, certainly some of us started noticing some behavioral changes. Um, it, it just um, cognitively and just the way she, her mind processed things uh, just seemed off, but n none of us knew about this Huntington's gene. Um, I found my birth mother and that inspired her to go look for her birth mother. And my parents had made the very, very difficult decision not to tell her about the fact that she was adopted from a woman who had the gene, which gave her a 50-50 chance of having it. Um, they made the decision not to tell her. She found her birth mother, found out that this was a real possibility, and now spent several years agonizing as to whether she was going to get the test to find out whether she had it. Um, and I can tell you, given what I saw in her over the years, I, I was quite fearful that it was, it was going to end up being a bad result, and, and ultimately it was. Um, and then she had to live with that. She had to live knowing that, but it, when, as soon as she hit 40, she was going to start deteriorating quite rapidly. She was going in Huntington's is just a, such a horrific disease because it, it robs you both of your, uh, your mental faculties, as well as physically your, your abilities physically. Uh, it, you basically just start wasting away in, in your brain and in your body, but slowly, 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 slowly. Um, or can be solely. Um, and, and sure enough at 40, you know, she, she, she knew, she knew it was coming and sure enough, it starts to come. And she just handled it with such grace and such courage and such, uh, uh humor. Um, and, uh, she was an absolute inspiration. And, uh, you know, my sister was never known to be particularly courageous. I don't think that's a word that anyone would ever have used to describe my sister, but boy, when she got this disease and she knew she had it, and then she started experiencing it, uh, she, 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 she absolutely became the, the bravest person I've ever, I've ever known because I, I just think I would have, if I couldn't do all the things that I do, if I was suddenly robbed, uh, so at such a young age of, of the things that I've taken such for, for, so for granted for so long to do that with a smile on your face and just go out there every day and, and keep, and keep persevering, uh, right till the end was, uh, was, uh, it's, it's, it's awe-inspiring. Wow. And what impact did that have on you and the rest of your family when she went through that? And I, I mean, I even I, I, I sympathize deeply with your parents about and I, I, I wouldn't wish that decision on anyone. Of, of, do you tell your child that there is a potential limitation on their life or do you keep that from them so that they can they don't have to bear the burden of that over the course of their life until it's necessary? Right. Yeah, uh, and that, you know, and then I mean, it's interesting how often we're talking about odds here, right? And I mean, there's yeah. a there's a classic example right there. Absolutely right. You know, you're right. Keeps keeps coming back to that mark. Yeah. That's that's that, and in that case, it was fifty fifty. And then it was how long is it going to take before you know before it takes you? And for some people, it's three years. For some people, it's twenty, and it's just odds, right? And and uh, yeah, so. Um, uh, you know, obviously very hard on my family, but, you know, certainly also brought us together. Um, uh, had all of us uh, feeling the same way about Aaron, just the, 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 the incredible courage and, and appreciating that and, and um, how we could, um, we all tried to do what we could to support her um, uh, and, and come together as a family in order to do that uh, uh, and appreciate just how as well, this was unfortunately so much of her own journey that you know, she, she had to go through. My parents um, uh, spent uh, six months in Victoria every year and six months in, in uh, Ottawa um, and wintered out there in Victoria. So they had moved back here uh, five years ago, uh, sold their home in Victoria, which they loved uh, to be close to her because they knew that they were going to have to start supporting her through the, through her last days. And she went much more quickly than, she, than we thought she would. But they, you know, they changed their life and, and, and gave up, you know, their home and, 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 and have stayed here because now they realize where they're here. I've got, you know, all three of the, of their boys are, are in Ottawa and grandkids and, and whatnot. So they've stayed. And so we're all very close. We all live very close, to, close to one another. And, and we, we, you know, we think about Aaron and, 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 and toast her every time we're together and, um, and feel thankful that we had her in our lives. 
Well, Jock, you've shared so much and and so many powerful stories and lessons uh, from your experience. Uh, and I, I think there there are many, many fascinating elements to your life story and many takeaways here. I'm really grateful for your time and you've been very generous with with what you've shared. Thank you so much. Well, it's been a pleasure, Mark. I, uh, you, you're, you're not kidding when you say we're going to go deep, but I decided that's what we got to do here because um, that's the only way that's the only way you can you can allow other people to 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 benefit from your own experiences. Right. Uh, you, you can't uh, you can't sugarcoat things and uh, you, you, uh, you know, this, the whole superficial um, approach to things. I, I don't think benefits those around you. And so you know, I thank you for, for this opportunity, because, as I said, um, my my goal in life is not only to maximize my own potential, but those around me uh, to the and this isn't this is just another opportunity to do that if even one person takes something away from something i've said then that was worth doing this and um that's why over the years i've done so many talks and, and shared as much as i can uh, um with people in the hopes that there's one person who will get one thing out of something that i might have said so this has been great thank you well i've already taken away lots of things from what you said so everybody else from here is just a bonus on top of that so great stuff thank you jock all right thanks Mark. I really like Jock's perspective on achieving your full potential and how that's different for everyone, and the message about increasing your odds of success with one small move at a time. Jock was one of the most open and candid guests that I've interviewed. I'm very grateful for everything that he shared. Like so many of you, I can also relate to the losses that he has suffered in his life. So once again, a very big thank you to Jock Climey for joining us on Digging Deep. And if you enjoyed this episode, please review it and share it with others. That will help us produce more great episodes. Now, if you want to keep digging deep into topics and lessons like this, or see the show notes about this episode, or subscribe to our weekly newsletter, or read my blog, you can do all of that at letsdigdeep.com. That's letsdigdeep.com. Thank you for listening. <laughs>